It certainly is good to be uh, with you all this morning. Uh, look out, and I see a uh, good crowd this morning. I also see some spots where we normally have some folks sitting that, that aren't there. There's a lot traveling this week with fall break, and we're uh, happy for them, and of course wish them a, a safe journey. Uh, with that said, though, with it being fall break, and also uh, for, for potentially other reasons, we've got visitors with us uh, here that have come from other places, and we're glad to have you uh, as well, and also saw a pretty good crowd out in the parking lot. Regardless, it is so good that we were able to gather together this morning and to worship our God and uh, hopefully uh, learn some things from His Word and to consider some things about how He would have us to live. Last week, we uh, began taking a look at the topic of social media um, and Christians and social media, I guess I should say. And, and thinking about some things that Christians need to be thinking about as they go online. We talked about last week that while social media is very much a part of how we communicate and how we connect with one another, we also realize that we as Christians, we need to be mindful of how we use it. Last week we talked a good bit about how social media at its root, it was designed to be addictive. And that caused us to think about some things. We also talked about how some of the potential temptations you know, that we can run into while we're on social media are real. And those are real dangers. And we need to guard against those things. In this lesson, I want to continue that discussion about Christians and social media. But specifically, as you see the title, I want to focus in on the divisive nature of social media. The fact is, is of course, since we can be so consumed by social media, what happens is that this gives way for these platforms to give us information that then causes us to, to form our opinions about the world that is around us. I believe that social media in many ways has amplified the division that exists between different groups of people in our society. You know, I'm not saying this morning that if we were to immediately get rid of social media, although I'd be curious what would happen if we did, but if we were to get rid of social media, I'm not saying that we would just all end up being friends. But I also can't help but think that social media, in many ways, it instigates a lot of the hatred and a lot of the division that we see out in society, or at least it amplifies it quite a bit. In this lesson, I want to talk about three areas that I believe that if we don't get control over and if we don't become aware of these things, we can be at risk of becoming part of this device of nature that social media is contributing to. I want to talk first about how the nature of social media, it creates for us a manipulated worldview. In other words, our view of the world is greatly manipulated by what these platforms choose to show us. I also want to spend some time this morning talking about social media and politics, especially as we consider the time and the season that we find ourselves in right now. And then finally, for a few minutes, I want to talk about the reality of the danger of false information that we find a lot online. You know, as I said in the past, I said this last week, I understand that there may be some of you listening this morning that have no connection with social media. And in some ways, I said that you're probably living a more peaceful life than the rest of us. So in many ways, this lesson may not be as relatable for you, but I also realize that the, the vast majority of my audience does have some sort of connection to social media. But regardless of whether you have a connection to social media or not, I think a lot of the things we're going to be talking about this morning are some principles that apply as we focus on social media. It certainly applies there, but it, it really applies even outside of that as well. So hopefully you'll find some benefit from that. So let us consider some things this morning as we seek to let our light shine as Christians uh, in the world. I believe that in many ways... Social media gives us a very manipulated view uh, of the world. In other words, viewing the world through the lens of social media, it gives us in, in many ways a very different view of the world than what actually lines up with reality. I fear that if our view of the world, if it can be so easily manipulated by social media, I think that this can also lead to the manipulation of our beliefs, but also our actions as well. So first, let's ask the question, well, well, so why would these social media platforms, why would they manipulate you? I think it goes back to what we talked about last week in our previous lesson. Their gain, their profit is very much tied to capturing your attention. The documentary I mentioned to you last week, The Social Dilemma, 
In that documentary, it was explained that essentially they show you whatever viewpoint lines up with whatever interests you. And they do this for the purpose of getting you hooked. We talked about that last week. So, for example, if you're of a conservative point of view, you're going to see a lot of things that are geared towards that point of view. If you're of a liberal point of view, again, you're going to see a lot of things that are, uh, that are geared towards that. And it really doesn't matter so much as whether or not what they're showing you is, is true or not. The point is that they show you something that gets and keeps your attention. And if they do that, regardless of whether it's true or not, they have accomplished their goal. And you could ask the question, well, you know, does that, wouldn't that cause a lot of problems in society if you think about how many people are connected to social media? Well, yeah. Yeah, it does. It causes a lot of problems. And even in the documentary, they admitted that from a moral standpoint, it is very irresponsible, the things that they are doing. But they also made the point that for these platforms, the profit that they get from our attention is much more valuable to them than the cost there is and the impact there is on society. With this in mind, the first point that I want to make to you this morning is that Christians, we need to be careful to avoid being, quote, triggered and what i mean by that word triggered is it's kind of a slang term that you see a lot even on social media and it's the idea of having some kind of intense or emotional reaction to some to something it's often associated with having a temper or or having a lack of self-control in the documentary the quote that i remember from that documentary it says if it seems like it's meant to push your buttons it probably is Again, when disagreements, when discussions break out on social media, they have successfully captured your time and your attention. Now, you know, when a conversation breaks out, it may end up being a really good conversation and that that can be profitable. But either way, their goal was accomplished. They've got your attention. So, for example, right now, a real life scenario that we have going on right now, right now, masks are a very popular topic everywhere, but especially on social media. For example, you may have those that that support the use of the mask and they may post something online explaining why they take their position and and why they believe in that. And you could really reverse this either way. It, It goes both ways. Perhaps they go a little bit further, not just explaining why they take their position, but why everybody that disagrees with them is silly. And I'm, I'm making that lightly. I've, there's, Stronger words that we could use for that. Then you have someone come along and they they read uh, what was said and they happen to take the other position. Well, they don't like that. They don't like people calling them silly on Facebook. So what do they do? They react emotionally. They tell that person off that had told them that they were silly. Is that how Christians ought to be? Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. Also think about what Paul said were among the works of the flesh where he listed enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. I think that Paul would suggest to us that there is a much better way of handling these moments where someone triggers us rather than to react in anger and without self-control. I think another problem that also comes from social media manipulating our perspective is that it makes it very difficult for people with opposing points of view to really understand the beliefs of others. And I think that this is a really big reason why social media has such a divisive nature. You know, it's very easy for us to see things that we don't, that we don't agree with and just dismiss it completely. You know, it's not uncommon for me to see a post about one point of view and then comments just replying, you idiot, I can't believe that you take that point of view. And again, I'm making this a lot more simple. I've seen much worse things and I know you have as well. But the question would be, what what good does that really do? What did you accomplish in, in doing that? I think about Acts chapter 17 where you see people with two different two different ways of approaching Uh, a message. There were the Thessalonians who had many Jews that you could say were quote-unquote triggered by a lot of these things that Paul and Silas were teaching them. 
And they said that they were turning the world upside down. They were rebelling against leaders. Then there were the Bereans, just a little bit further down. They weren't immediately dismissive of, of different points of view, but they examined the claims against the source of truth, which in this case was the Scripture, to see if they checked out. Now I understand that these examples in Acts chapter 17 were examples in regards to matters of faith, but I also think that these principles could be applied just in all our dealings with one another. You know, there is some manner of appreciation for those that are like the Bereans to just not dismiss anything that opposes our current belief, anything that they don't like, but to consider it against the truth and make a decision about it then. You know, it's easy for us to assume that we are always right and just dismiss anything that is different from that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, the, the golden rule as we call it is this, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So how would I want to be treated? You know, I hope that when I want to share information about the gospel, my hope is that they treat me with respect, they consider what I share with them, and they examine it to see if it's true. You know, I hope that when I share the truth of the gospel with them, I'm not met immediately with replies of, you idiot, I can't believe that you believe that stuff in the Bible. We know that's how we would want to be treated. And if we know that, that's how we need to treat our neighbor. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that after hearing others out that we're just going to believe them. That's not the way this works. Sometimes we examine things against the truth and we find them to be false. But we ought to treat others with the respect that we would want ourselves. Brethren, let's be aware this morning that social media, it has a way of manipulating us. And being aware of this, let us not seek to be so easily triggered by everything that we're shown because that is the exact reaction that these platforms are probably hoping to get from us. Christians need to be those that have self-control. We don't need to just contribute to the problem. The topic of social media and politics is not a comfortable subject. But yet, given the current season, I think that it is something that we as Christians, we need to be thinking about. And I say this because I know for me personally, the topic of politics, again, me personally, I'm talking to Kevin here, it carries with it great temptation. The reality is, is that we do live in a country that gives us a voice. We have the freedom of speech. Therefore, Christians will, you know, in some ways, have some say or some influence over the direction of our government. However, with that opportunity also comes the reality that Christians, we can just as easily be caught up in this situation and act like the rest of the world and end up behaving in inappropriate ways. Last week in our previous lesson, you know, we talked about the fact that the comment section of, of any social media post can be a place where civility and where love for neighbor just goes to die. You know, if you were to go through Facebook, for example, especially like, for example, we had the debate the other night. We've had a couple of debate now. And if you were to go on social media, especially the, the day or two after that or, or immediately right after it, it wouldn't, take you to, it wouldn't take you long to find some conversations happening about it. Probably wouldn't take you much longer to find a conversation where people were being very hateful towards one another. There'd be name calling. There'd be character attacks. It's just not a, something you would hope to see in regular interaction. And you know what? When it's the world that's involved in that type of behavior, it doesn't surprise me. But unfortunately, sometimes it's not the world. Sometimes it's us. You know, if there's anyone that understands that politics often hits on certain issues that we might be very passionate about, it is me. For example, abortion is a, a, a topic that just really gets me fired up. That is something I'm passionate about. I, I get it. We're concerned about the moral direction of our country. We're concerned about decisions that might impact our living. We're concerned about very important matters. I'm not dismissing that. I get that feeling of desperation when someone else's seemingly radical views might interfere with our own rights or, or push us in a direction that we don't believe in is wise. 
I get it. Sometimes these feelings and, and passions, they lead us to passionately and sometimes strongly disagree with others. Sometimes that disagreement, though, it results in us getting involved in the works of the flesh. Christians are told to love. We're told to love God. We're told to love our brethren. And we're told to love others. Or as Jesus terms it in, the, or in Mark chapter 12 and verse 31, He terms it our neighbor. Brethren, that means I'm called to love you, whether you are a Republican or whether you are a Democrat. Love is patient. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. When we get on social media and we see someone promoting something that we think is outlandish, it's contrary to our political views, is it loving for me to turn around and call them stupid? Is it loving for me to call them an idiot and tell them, this was a popular one, to just, I want you to leave the country. But what if they call me an idiot first? You have heard it said, and it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Christians ought not return hatred for hatred. We are called to be better than that. Another thing that we need to remember as we let our voices be heard on social media in regard to politics is that the Bible is not silent about what our attitudes ought to be towards our leaders. We're called in Romans 13 and verses 1 and 2, or at the beginning of that chapter rather, we are called to be subject to our authorities. He says at the beginning of that chapter, he says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Again, we live in a country where we have the, the freedom of speech. But understand that for Christians, this is not a license to be disrespectful towards our leaders. We can disagree. We can express our disagreement. I've done that with leaders in the past. Sometimes the right way, sometimes the wrong way. But Christians ought to disagree respectfully. Romans 13 indicates that we are in part going to be judged based on whether or not we were submissive to those that were in authority. Yes, there is that principle that we, we point out quite often that we must obey God rather than man when man's laws violate God's laws. We get that. However, there is also the principle that whenever possible, we ought to be citizens that respect those that are in authority. You know, and I'll tell you that when my chosen leader is the one that is in office, that is very easy for me to say. However, this applies even when the leader that we don't care for is in power. And that may be more difficult, but we're still called to be that way. Also, 1 Timothy 2, we are called to pray for our leaders. You know, I can't help but wonder this morning that if you know this country, I wonder if we would be much stronger spiritually if we would spend a lot less time calling people names on Facebook and we spent more time following Paul's instructions here in 1 Timothy 2 and pray for our leaders as we did this morning. You know, it may not give us that temporary satisfaction that we get when we make fun of people of the other party, but prayer is a lot more powerful and it is a lot more helpful. You know, I question how helpful it's going to be for in one moment for me to post online about how idiotic our leaders are and then turn around and pray for them. I don't think, it, I don't think that's what he meant in 1 Timothy 2. We should pray for our leaders, as Paul told Timothy, so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. You know, one point that I believe is personal for me Maybe it is for you as well. It needs to be if it's not. Because I wonder sometime about the impact that our political activity online has on our ability to influence for the gospel. This morning, I want you to honestly consider these points. You know, the Bible teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount, but also in other places, that spiritual things are so much more of value than the worldly. So the question is, is how should this impact 
our online activity, especially in regards to politics. You know, if I can be blunt with you this morning, sometimes it seems to me that we have a lot more concern over how someone votes as compared to whether or not that person is prepared for eternity. Brethren, presidents and governments, governors, all these earthly authorities, they are all temporary. But matters concerning eternity are not temporary. What if I told you this morning that you have a, a friend on your, your friends list, on your Facebook friends list? They, they, uh, you, you friended them in the past. Maybe you know them a lot. Maybe, maybe just casual. And, and maybe they're not a Christian. But they know that you go to church. They know that you believe in God. And they're not a Christian, but they're, they're interested in getting their life right. They know that they need to, to make a change in their life. And they thought about asking you some questions. But then you posted something online in such a way that they questioned whether or not you really loved your neighbor as Christians are called to do. That should make you think. That should make you think before you post online. I'm talking to me there too. You know, while statistics show that members of the Church of Christ are, are actually a lot more political divided than we might uh, assume, I also feel safe in assuming that the majority of us, at least in this audience right now, are probably lean of a conservative mindset. I was actually reading an article on the topic of Christians and politics and social media. And a quote that hit me from the article, it says, statistically, the unchurched lean heavily Democrat. So, if you want to reach the unchurched, Maybe constant Facebook and Twitter posts about how stupid Democrats are might be a bad idea. I get it. I don't like socialism. I don't like extreme gun control. I don't like big government. That's not my political preference. I even more so get not being in favor of abortion and gay marriage, which are contradictory to what the Bible teaches us. However, I also realize that by calling people idiots on Facebook, I probably lose whatever influence I may have to influence that person to the gospel. Understand this morning, I, I'm not saying that Christians ought not be active in the political process. I, I enjoy politics. I, I, I try and follow it, at least in a limited sense. I will say I probably enjoy it a little bit less these days, though. If you believe you should vote, vote. You know, Vote based on your convictions. However, on the point of Christians and social media and politics, let us not be so invested in this world that we fail to place our treasure in heaven. Let us not let our politics keep us from treating others with love. Let us not let our politics diminish our influence for sharing the gospel. This morning, briefly, I want us to touch uh, very briefly again on the topic of false information on social media. And then the lesson will be yours. You know, I hate to break it to you. There is a lot of false information on the Internet. Rumors and half-truths and misrepresentations of the truth, those things are nothing new. But however, as social media has made communication just so easy to now be able to send and receive uh, and also believe this false information that, that passes around. It's just so easy for us to believe these things in 2020. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln that says, don't believe everything that you read on the Internet. If you're in your cars right now, I've got a picture of Abraham Lincoln with that quote. Of course, we know that Abraham Lincoln never said that. But the point being is that with a little bit of Internet magic, you can make fake news appear more real than you ever could in the past. You know, it's not uncommon for me to, to scroll through social media and see people sharing articles that have these wild headlines. And usually these articles fit into some sort of certain bias that they may already have. As social media is how we get most of our news, but it's scary to know that based on a study by MIT scholars, that fake news travels way faster than real news does. Fake news, it spreads so quickly. But brethren, it doesn't do it on its own. We can be guilty of contributing to this. Again, I want you to keep in mind, what you see online, they're not always giving you the truth. 
They are giving you whatever information will make them more money by keeping your attention and keeping you active on Facebook. God's people, we ought to be those that only tell the truth. In Proverbs chapter 6, we see that among the things that the Lord hates are lying tongues, false witnesses, and those that sow discord. Bearing false witness is something that God's people were warned about going back all the way at least to the Ten Commandments. But what do we do? We see an article that supports something that we like and we just assume since we like it, we assume that it's true. Then we share it. Then someone else sees it. Then they share it. And what's happened? We've contributed to the problem by helping spread false information because we liked what it said. You know, when I was thinking earlier about how our politics might potentially impact our ability to, to influence non-Christians to the gospel, I think we can make a very similar point on this point as well. If I am a person that is constantly sharing false information online, how is anyone going to trust me when it comes to me telling them the truth about the gospel? You know, if I'm a conspiracy theorist that's always sharing these outlandish articles online that have no credibility, what are people going to think when I try and talk to them about the gospel? A quote from Christianity Today on, on this actual topic, it says, here, here's the quote, I, I should have put it on the board, but I didn't. It says, nothing is true simply because it is believable or because it fits our worldview or preference. Nothing is untrue simply because it is unbelievable or doesn't fit our worldview or preference. As Christians, we believe some things that would qualify as unlikely or straight up unbelievable. Brethren, the message of the gospel is understandably shocking to some, just as a wild fake news headline might be. We are telling people about the good news that God sent His Son to die and was raised on the third day. That doesn't happen every day. But it is pertinent that we get this message to the world because these things are factual and because they impact eternity. And if I share a lot of fake news on social media, why would anyone give me the time of day when I try and share with them the truth about the gospel? So what do we do? Well, my first suggestion would be this morning is you don't have to share everything that you see online. True or not, you just don't. I'm not saying that you, you can't. I'm just saying you don't have to share everything. You know, if you think that it's important, I would encourage you to research it a little bit. Don't assume that just a single source of news is going to tell you the truth. Also, secondly, along with that, consider the source. Consider if they are reliable. Consider whether or not they have something to gain through misleading you with fake information. And also, finally, consider your reason for sharing. Again, remembering the idea that our ability to influence those around us, it has limitations. Is sharing this information how I want to use what limited influence I have? I'm not trying to suggest to you this morning that we never share information online. However, as Christians, we need to be those that resolve to be committed to the truth and not people that have a reputation of sharing gossip and sharing false information online. We've got to be very careful about that. In conclusion this morning, social media, it presents for us a lot of opportunity for both good and for evil. Again, I, I, I want to talk about some of the good that it, it, we can use it for in, in a future lesson. But based on our lesson this morning, let us be careful to not let these things manipulate us. Let us not let these platforms trigger us and cause us to behave in a way that Christians ought not do. Let us be especially careful when it comes to navigating social media. Let us be very careful in this current political season that we have. Let us also be careful when it comes to false information. Because if a Christian is not careful in these areas, it can really damage our ability to influence someone for the gospel. Our mission as Christians is to love God and to love our neighbor. And that needs to be our priority. Let's not let our use of social media interfere with that priority. Let's use it for good. Let's not use it for evil. 
This morning, if you're here today and you realize that you need to make a change in the way that you interact with your neighbor online, do that. Repent of that. Change that. You can change that. Repent and resolve to be more Christ-like. Don't let your internet activity cause you to lose your soul. And also, finally, this morning, are you here today and are you not a Christian? You know, we've talked a lot this morning about how man has the ability to manipulate the truth. And the ultimate source of truth is God. And He has provided us His Word so that we can study it and we can know what His will is for us. Man will twist it. Man will add to. Man will take away from it. But you need to read it for yourself. You need to read what the truth of God's Word says. And Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. That is the truth. That is right there from the Lord in Mark chapter 16. It's not a fake news article. It's not a fake headline. This is from the ultimate source of truth. My question for you this morning, if you're not a Christian, is what are you going to do with it? This morning, if you find yourself subject to the Lord's invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.